um, since 2009. Uh, it is an absolute honor and privilege to be able to be part of this amazing conference. I'm so grateful to the organizers, Yosef Halakha, Atara Ice, and Sir Rabbi Elon Mazur, and all the people who have been so involved behind the scenes in terms of making this um, amazing event with so much information available for everybody. And, and Okay, and we're back. Great, so it's wonderful to be here. I am speaking today about fertility awareness method and halakha and different ways in which those who are interested in practicing fertility awareness method, either for contraceptive um, purposes or for fertility related reasons, and um, what, what comes up for them halakhically. And of course, also to just give some background, a nice amount of background uh, about what fertility awareness method is and, and the different reasons that people choose to, to practice it and then the, the reasons that um, some people choose not to. Uh, use it as a method for either contraceptive uh, for contraceptive purposes. Before I get started with um, uh, with the talk, I just want to get a sense of what all of you are looking to hear. Uh, what brings you to this lecture? What are you hoping I'm going to cover? You're welcome to stick that into the chat right now um, or over the course of the talk, so that I can hopefully make sure that I address all of your various questions and issues. And um, okay. Great. So I'm just going to give another few seconds if anyone wants to throw something there in the chat before we get started, and then we will be proceeding with um, our slideshow to get a better understanding of what fertility awareness method is, um, and to also, um, yeah, to, to understand as women go through their cycles, what are the different halakhic issues that come up over the course of, of, of a woman's cycle. Okay, so with no further ado, and um, you feel free, obviously, to keep sending in questions. Let's just start with what fertility awareness method is. So the I have a little quote here uh, that was written up by Michal Schoenbrunn, who is the um, fertility awareness method guru here in Israel. She is the one who has really changed the face of women's education about their bodies here and educates the educators. And um, I will make it very clear, I myself am not trained as a fertility awareness method educator. I'm a Yuatzat Halakha, I'm a Milavat Poriyud. And as part of my training and because I just find it, I find the human body and the reproductive system specifically to be fascinating. It's something that I, um, do a lot of learning and reading about but that being said i must make it very clear i'm certainly not an authority figure when it comes to fertility awareness method and, and as much as i feel confident to give you a general sense of how the method works i encourage you all to obviously you can always take everything i say with a grain of salt and certainly before using the method as a formal method as opposed to just information about body awareness um certainly as a method for contraception i um, would strongly encourage someone to really um, learn, for, I, first of all, to read the book on the topic, Taking Charge of Your Fertility, um, was a book written by Tony Wexler, um, which is very informative. Uh, so I've encountered people, Orthodox Jews, who are uncomfortable with the title, Taking Charge of Your Fertility. Like, what do you mean God is in charge of our fertility? What do you mean taking charge? And what my, my sense of that is like, of course God is in charge of our fertility. We know that's one of the three keys in life that, you know, is in God's hands and there's only so much we can do. That being said, there is so much we can do. Um, and I, I believe that it's our proper hishtadlut, our, you know, putting in our proper due diligence to do our part in terms of working with the amazing equipment that God has equipped us with. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, certainly for people considering using fertility awareness method as an actual method of contraception, uh, there is nothing like learning live from a real educator. And um, it seems that those who do learn from proper fertility awareness method educators uh, feel a much higher degree of confidence in terms of using the system in a way that they find is effective. Okay, so here we go with the definition. The fertility awareness method is an evidence-based tool for gaining body awareness, body literacy, and achieving or avoiding pregnancy. It is natural, safe, and highly effective when learned and used correctly. Regardless of the goal, the overall purpose of fertility awareness method is to accurately determine the window of fertility, when the window of fertility opens and closes, confirm that ovulation occurs, and verify that the menstrual cycle is in fact working as it should in hormonal balance. When a woman knows how to identify her fertility days, 
pregnancy can be more easily achieved or it can be avoided through abstinence or the use of other backup methods. And before we go on, I do just want to emphasize that, yes, there are those who really use this as a method um, and they follow all the rules and the rules are very specific. Um, and there are others who like really it doesn't work for them and they have no interest in using this as their method of, of contraception, uh, but they still are very grateful to have like a kind of general understanding of what's going on in their bodies. And um, now for people who are currently using hormonal contraceptives, uh, most of them for most women kind of shut off um, a large amount of what would normally be going on hormonally in the woman's body. And the changes that happen in a woman's normal cycle would not necessarily be perceived. Um, that being said, like I, I think that, um, I think that we're so blessed to be living in an era that women really do have um, the opportunity to be able to really educate themselves in so many different ways and to uh, have access to so much knowledge. And uh, in such an era, I think that um, we wouldn't, I, I mean, I personally, it can speak for myself, I would hope that um, the knowledge that, that used to be so intuitive um, and sometimes um, you know, when, when women all live together in much more tribal types of settings and things that people kind of knew more intuitively, I think it would be unfortunate if we lost that connection to knowledge of our bodies as we gain more knowledge about other areas of information in the world. And uh, we do live at a time that we really can first and foremost get information about our um about our own bodies, which I think is not just a, a tremendous privilege and opportunity, um, but I, I, I also see it as a form of a, of a responsibility. Um, and and I, I think that when people do have, um, I, every culture and society and time is very different in terms of the messages that are kind of being given to women in terms of what it means to um, live a meaningful life and be a productive member of society and be their best selves. And I think that women inside of them often have like many little microphones, many little voices. And the question of what microphone society is holding up inside women really makes a very big difference in terms of um, how they feel about um, themselves. Uh, and, and, and the whole notion that women cycle is something that that is sometimes not popular. Sometimes women don't want to be doing, you know, feel differently, different ways, physically, emotionally. Um, and some women don't feel so different, different days. But but in the end of the day, um, our for those who are not intervening with their normal menstrual cycle, um, women cycle uh, when they are health, healthy and blessed to be doing so. Um, and I think that sometimes in society that comes along with like an, oh, like, a, oh, I got my period or, oh, you know, I can't, um, you know, it, it, sometimes people have like a negative attitude about it. And I think that um, the more people understand about like the awesome, unbelievable, miraculous uh, nature of, of our nature, uh, it, it, it can totally change that narrative from a place of people feeling a sense of frustration to feeling a sense of just like absolute awe. And like, okay, there may be cramps, there may be for cramps, there may be all sorts of different things, but this sense of just feeling blown away by like the, 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 the magnitude and my cross, like the, just the whole thing, I think is, is something that um, many people find very meaningful. Uh, not even within the religious world, we see a lot about women cycling in terms of um, Rosh Hashanah being a woman's holiday because women were ovulating with the full moon and getting their menstruation, getting their periods around Rosh Hashanah and, and that whole notion of, um, of like, Halafa being around, like, oh, like that's the day you should be hanging out with your friends and like having a nice meal together. Like, don't do laundry. Like, you know, th that's an idea that that um, you know we have it in our tradition, but it's something that that in other uh, religions or non-religious traditions, people are connecting to as well. Uh, Christian Northrop, who wrote the very famous book, um, Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom, I think, uh, a whole bunch of books about women's health. So she has a daughter, I think her name is Kate, who wrote a book, and she's not, certainly not Jewish, and I don't know if religious, really writing about how like women being aware of their cycles is something that can help them optimize their performance. And, um, and then she has all of these anecdotes about how when she was on the, like on some boating type of um, team in school and they would spend months on the boat how all the women got their their periods with the new moon which i always find fascinating to see those ideas in halacha actually being reflected um, in terms of contemporary research uh, but what i'm trying with my what i want to convey is that that some people connect more to this notion of cycling and some people less but irrespective of like you know the 
of how much people connect to it. I do think that women knowing what's going on in their bodies is something that's um, a, a life affirming and empowering experience uh, that helps people feel much more comfortable in their own skin. Now, sometimes when people do learn more about what goes on in their bodies and they keep halacha, they, they sometimes come into things thinking like, okay, I'm supposed to be nida when I'm menstruating and I'm not supposed to be nida when I'm not menstruating. And then they could be like, noticing that when they ovulate on day seven of their Shiva Nikian before they go to the mikvah, that there's this like streak of, of blood and all of this clear fertile cervical fluid. And they're like, oh, that's so cool. That must be connected to ovulation. And, you know, it happens to be if they catch that on a, that on a bedika cloth, that is going to make them be that. And that's something that could make people feel like, whoa, what's going on? Like, that's not my period. Isn't my period supposed to be just when I'm you know, mens sorry. Yeah, that's not my period. Shouldn't I just be needed if I'm menstruating? And, and, and that's really like why I'm here is to point out that, you know, halacha, menstruation does not always necessarily equal nida and vice versa. And, and in addition to women know, like having a greater sense of what goes on in their bodies and having those glasses to put on to look inside of themselves and feel a sense of awareness about their own bodies, there's this other pair of glasses of like halachic awareness that I think are important for people to be able to put on as well. Um, and when people understand that, like, the, our tradition from the Torah Shabbat through the Torah Shabbat has specific ways of defining nida status that often correlates with menstruation, but doesn't always correlate with menstruation. I think that that awareness helps people live in, which, with a much greater sense of harmony, not just with themselves as women, but with themselves as halachically practicing Jews, because they can see the very same thing that has come out of them. They can have a sense of what it's doing there and they can have a sense of like, okay, what does this mean halachically? Um, and and uh, yeah, that's really what I'm hoping for us to understand is how to make sure that the types of things that should not be making women nida in halacha don't make women nida in halacha also if they're practicing fertility awareness methods. Okay, so before we get to the halachic piece and like walking through with the halacha and the cycle, let's just talk a little bit about what the whole basis of fertility awareness method is. So if you look at the next slide, you'll see the uterus. Um, and the following slide, we'll see also we're going to toggle back and forth between them, is the horm basically what's going on hormonally. Again, I'm not a doctor, just want to give you like a little bit of a brief, quick sense of what's going on here. So basically, um, fertility awareness method uh, is some, it is is a method that teaches which and i'll just say parenthetically there's a whole bunch of fertility awareness based methods out there um it fertility awareness method is very different from any app or any anything that's predictive in the sense of like okay let's see how long your cycles were before even if they involve let's see what your temperature is that's not you know fertility awareness method that, that we're talking about here, because here, as opposed to just being about being predictive, uh, this is about being observational, really observing what's going on in the body in the given cycle, because really what people are trying to identify here is their fertile window, meaning women are not fertile all month, although I did hear once from a doctor that there has been research that shows that women, there have, there have been women who have conceived on each day of the cycle, as uh, Dr. Dina Zimmerman once said, said, you know, some women, their bodies just didn't read the book. But, you know, that being said, uh, at least according to the book, women do have a fertile window. And we don't only want to identify when that fertile window closes, we really want to identify when it opens. Certainly, if people are trying to conceive, but also if people are trying to avoid conception. Um, so with that, there are basically three different main signs of things that happen naturally in the body that are easily perceptible to any person in the comfort of their own home. Uh, changes that happen in the body because of the hormonal changes that are going on. Okay, so if we go back for a second to the uterus, you'll see, okay, so basically girls are, this is like the quick you know, footnotes on this one. Girls are basically born with all of the eggs they're going to have uh, on the surface of their ovary. From when they reach puberty, their body starts releasing eggs. The body works on ripening a whole bunch of eggs at the same time, um, really because of like a survival of the fittest type of thing. Like you never know if one isn't gonna be so good. And, and what, what's in charge of making all these changes happen are hormones. Hormones basically um, are messengers that go through the body and they're different, they're released from different places and they have receptors in different places. Uh, and, the, and, and those hormones just transmit really important messages. So there are two main centers of hormone uh, of hormone release that are connected to women's reproductive cycle. One is in the, in the pituitary or anterior pituitary uh, glands in the brain, um, and the other one uh, is from the ovary itself. 
So from the brain, one if we see on the hormone chart, one of the main uh, ones is FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which on the chart I think is the red one. So which is basically kind of always there, but like in different amounts and doing different things. But the body is on some degree always stimulating new follicles. Um, and those follicles are there to um, basically, you can see the, the pictures across the top in the ovarian histology, the, the eggs are all kinds of like in the deep freezer. Um, and then every month, a bunch of them are gonna be ripened. Really one is supposed to be really one or two if the woman is ovulating for twins, like one from each side, um, one is gonna be released from either one side or, or one from, from each side in any given month, but a whole bunch of them are always being made, right? Um, and it's the follicle stimulating hormone that's doing that. Uh, as it's doing that, one of the hormones from the ovary, the, the estrogen, here it's called estradiol, um, the, uh, so that hormone is um, uh, basically thickening the uterine lining. If we go back to the uterus for a second, there's um, basically the uterus has um, the endometrium, which it's not labeled here on the chart, but the endometrium is the uterine lining. Uh, there are multiple layers of endometrium and the, the the inner one, the ones closer to the walls are kind of always there. And this is outer layer of endometrium that the body builds basically like a fresh landing pad for a potential egg that would land every month. Now, as that is happening, other changes are happening for the body to prepare for ovulation. Because once that egg is going to be released, the, the egg is going to... Um, it, it's going to be released from the surface of the ovary. It's going to be swept up by those finger-like structures called fimbria that you see, and it's going to make it there to like the first third of the fallopian tube. And um, within 24 hours, if it gets fertilized, it will be fertilized. Otherwise, it will atrophy and die. So basically, the woman's uterus is, you know, the, the woman's body is like, okay, considering that this egg is going to live for 24 hours, we want to get the sperm in before the egg is released, right? It's kind of like lining up for the concert, you know, sleep in your sleeping bags like the night before so that you're going to be able to get the tickets. That's what the body's kind of trying to do. It's like, let's get all the sperm in, in advance, because while the egg is only going to live 24 hours, the sperm can live for as long as the fertile environment, uh, basically for as long as this environment allows. And um, if there's really if it's not a fertile environment, uh, then the, the sperm cells will die in a matter of minutes, for sure up to six hours, which we'll speak about soon about diaphragms in terms of like, um, if, if the sperm is not being nourished, it's not going to be able to live. Whereas if the sperm is being nourished, is being fed sperm food, as it were, then it can, can you know, it has its say Dala Dara fills its backpack, you know, full of snacks and goodies. So then that sperm can live for easily two or three days, obviously depending on its morphology and, and you know, the sperm counts and all of that in terms of like the likelihood of the woman conceiving. But fundamentally, sperm in a fertile environment can live for a very, very long time, um, even more than three days, four or five, I, you know, I've heard. Uh, but two to three is pretty standard for talking about like the sperm hanging out in a fertile environment. So basically, in the days prior to ovulation, that that's when the body wants to like let the sperm in, give out the, the goodie bags of, of the food, of the sperm food, so that the sperm's gonna be able to kind of make it and like camp out there in the first third of the fallopian tube so that when the egg makes her grand exit um, and is released, the sperm will be there ready to greet her. Uh, so the way that the body lets the sperm in is basically um, has a lot to do with the cervix. The cervix is basically the gatekeeper of the uterus. You see it there in the picture. It's kind of in Hebrew, they call it savar harechem, the neck of the uterus, and that's kind of what it looks like. Um, it does a bunch of things to keep things out when they don't belong there and let things in when they do. So when the woman is not fertile, the cervix will kind of just like um, not let in foreign things. It generally, the way that it lets things in or doesn't let things in predominantly has to do with the secretions that it produces. It's cervical mucus, people call it cervical secretions. Some people prefer to call it. Um, and those secretions are um, when the woman is not fertile. Uh, and again, you know, everyone should, who's interested should read the book. This is really, you know, uh, you know, the, the cliff notes on this one, uh, the spark notes, whatever. The, um, when the woman is not really fertile, there will be like a sticky type of secretion or no secretion at all. Basically like a natural spermicide almost, like an acidic type of sticky secretion. And uh, I'll show you pictures in a second. Uh, and that's that indicates if once that's there, it's kind of like there, there are changes that are about to happen. But that in itself, um, you know, according to the Mahmir opinion of the Shita is already considered you know, a sign that the window is about to open, but the sticky in and of itself is not really a fertile secretion. Whereas 
um, as the days are going to go by the, and, and the woman comes closer to when her egg is going to be released, those sticky secretions that are kind of like glue stick will transition to being like hand lotion-y, like a milky, creamy type of consistency. And from there to the really fertile secretion, which is kind of like raw egg white, um, which I'll, I'll show you these pictures in a second. But that type of raw egg white is basically like the sperm food. When women have this, even without like practicing any methods, and this is also just parenthetically great information for new people who are getting married, people who teach those who are getting married, like a really like a basic sense of like, hmm, you know, for people who are, you know, getting married at a point in life where they're not particularly stressed to be conceiving that second and at the same time um, aren't necessarily going to use contraception, kind of just a little bit of basic knowledge and information can be so helpful. Even for people who are not married, who have irregular cycles, who kind of want to like know what's going on. They don't want to always feel like they never know when they're going to get their period. And um, this type of information is just like, you know, really God gives it to us at our fingertips. Um, and, and it makes it really clear where a woman is in her cycle. Um, so that type of stretchy, fertile cervical fluid by stretchy, I mean, if, uh, if you think of egg white, if a woman were to put it between her fingers and open up her fingers, it would stretch. Um, like it wouldn't break right away. And women often also have a, a like a wet, in the sensation when they're when they have that type of secretion they just feel internal wetness vaginally that is probably when the woman is most fertile because in as much as her egg hasn't been released yet that's when her body is letting the sperm in now often if women are trying to conceive or they're not sure they have irregular cycles they have polycystic ovaries they'll be so like oh why don't you just do ovulation tests now what ovulation tests test for if we go back to the hormone chart is that they they test for um when the woman has actually ovulated that little uh, green peak that you see in the middle that is the luteinizing hormone so basically once the brain because of you know the whole hormonal system once it realizes that there are follicles that are ripe enough for the egg to be released from them uh, so then the body wants to basically pop the most ripe follicle and it does that by releasing this luteinizing hormone and that luteinizing hormone um, is going to rupture the most ripe follicle um, and it's going to be around for 48 hours that hormone. Now that means that in theory, if the woman is going to ovulate once from each side, that could happen like with a 24 hour break between the ovulations and the woman could kind of like ovulate on one side and take a pass, you can ovulate for the other side and end up with fraternal twins. Uh, but fundamentally the most right follicle is going to rupture. Now when people are testing for ovulation with urine tests, that, um, what they're testing for is that hormone, LH. They want to see, in my urine, is there LH? But LH is only released into the body when the body is about to release the egg. And women generally who are testing using these urine sticks are doing so once every 24 hours. So the woman could check at 6 p.m. and it could be negative. Her LH could have gone out there at 7 p.m. She could be, it might not take that long for the egg to be released. And by the time she checks the next day at 6 p.m., that egg might be around for maybe another hour, um, which might not help her very much. Um, and she has missed that whole fertile window beforehand when there was that fertile cervical fluid. So really that awareness of that fertile cervical fluid, that wet sensation is really key in terms of people um, knowing when they're most fertile, which again is helpful both for con contraceptive and, and purposes of, of conception. And um, one other change that I'll just go back to, if we go back to the picture of the cervix for a second, is that in addition to making this fertile cervical fluid, um, to prepare for the, the exit of the egg in the days before. And by the way, women who are younger, like teens can have like five days of fertile cervical fluid, whereas women in their 40s can have like 12 hours of fertile cervical fluid. And while this is for sure not the only determiner in terms of fertility, um, certainly in terms of the interplay with the male sperm counts, morphology, et cetera, there's no question. I mean, I don't, you can never say there's no question. There are questions about everything, but it does seem that the, the, the more and higher quality um, fertile cervical fluid a woman has, the better her chances are of, of conceiving. And I would say also, we'll get to the halachic piece, and I'll mention it again, but it's really very relevant now. Um, sometimes women might be doing ovulation tests and they might see that they're, for sure, if on an ovulation test, the woman is ovulating before she's going to the mikvah and she's trying to conceive. That's for sure a reason to speak to halachic authority about figuring out ways to get to the mikvah sooner. Uh, but sometimes the, the test might even show that she's ovulating after she goes to the mikvah. But if she has these really wet vaginal sensations on day six, 
of her shiv nikim and by day seven she's really feeling dry and it's been a few months since she hasn't conceived that's also information to bring to a rub and that's all or some type of halachic authority and that's something that that halachic authority should be taking into account in terms of enabling the woman to get to the mikvah sooner because in as much as she might be ovulating later if basically your cervix has shut the gate in that it's not like giving out the packages of the food for the road anymore to the sperm that could certainly impact a woman's fertility as well and the other thing that the cervix does other than produce these secretions is that it also moves every month so the cervix we know when women have babies that cervix dilates and like moves up and out of the way and opens up 10 centimeters you know wide in diameter uh, every month though even a woman is not having a baby her cervix does move somewhat um, it moves when she has her period it also moves up it's basically there are three parameters of cervical um like movement and consistency. Uh, the question of how high is it within the vaginal canal, you kind of can see from the picture that there are those walls of the of the vaginal canal and the cervix, the bottom of it kind of dips down into it. Uh, so it kind of lifts up and down. Uh, so when a woman has her period and also as she approaches ovulation, the cervix does move up. Um, it also opens, like the opening, which you can't see in this picture, but I'll show you in a second. Uh, the opening opens more when the woman is fertile. Um, and it also softens. So if the cervix feels like the tip of the nose when a woman is not fertile, it will feel like the inside of her cheek when she is. And just another parenthetical statement. And um, you know, everyone grows up in different types of homes. I think that the culture, I once heard an Israeli lecturer uh, here, uh, an Orthodox woman speaking about uh, just impact, you know, raising our daughters, you know, for healthy body image and healthy sexuality. She was pointing out that in Israel, a lot of people uh, like, you know, using proper anatomical terms, and I don't think it's just in Israel, using proper anatomical terms for genitalia is something that sometimes people are uncomfortable with. Um, but like, it's something that's very healthy and important, I think, for people to know that the, the terms of what people call the different parts of their bodies. This Israeli woman was saying that when girls learn to urinate in the toilet, then the mothers tell them, okay, and now wipe yourself. And the, the, the girl will say, what should I wipe? And the mother will say, uh, you know, it's an egvieta pipi, and the, the pipi also means urine, but some people will call the girl's vulva her pipi, and that's really confusing. Like, I just made my pipi in the toilet, you're telling me to wipe my pipi, what's going on here? Um, and there's this, just this place of like recognizing that we want to send to ourselves, to our children, with empowering messages about the fact that our bodies are ours, we can call all of our body parts, you know, every, obviously everyone and the way they understand and define the value of new, but fundamentally, I think from a sexual health perspective, we're making sure people don't end up in the hands of predators who take advantage of lack of information. You know, what we see externally is the vulva, inside is the vaginal canal. Um, I mentioned this because, uh, right, in terms of people's comfort with the notion of uh, assessing cervical position. Uh, so this is something that really, in terms of fertility awareness, is something, as I mentioned, like women can, it's a perceptible difference. If a woman feels her cervix once, she may not know if it feels like her nose or like the inside of her cheek. If women are checking regularly, they will have a clear understanding of the, of the differences because they are perceptible. Um, a woman's vaginal canal is the length of her finger. Any woman who keeps Tarat Amishpacha knows that she's supposed to be able to insert her badika cloth up to her cervix. Um, so in that regard, it's something that some people are more comfortable with. Uh, but the, like, I think that the notion of women, um, irrespective of whether they're accustomed to this because of keeping halakha, women's vaginal canals are theirs. They should feel comfortable, you know, everyone and whatever makes them comfortable. But essentially, like, the mouth is a pretty similar environment to the vaginal canal. And if someone has something stuck in their teeth, they're generally fine, kind of, you know, either washing their hands before or not moving the thing out there to get washing their hands again or not and i would say with the vaginal canal it's also it's part of our body that we can easily access and you know it's um you know just give, making it clear that women certainly have permission to uh to to explore and discover what is really very accessible to them without anything invasive that being said the notion of cervical position is something that's considered a tertiary sign in terms of fertility awareness that kind of just corroborates the other signs of the cervical secretions and temperature which we'll speak about um, uh, but there it is a change that is perceptible and as the woman is ovulating her cervix will be up open and out of the way so to just to show you some quick pictures here um, uh, you can see me in the screen here. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I was nervous about copyright law, so I didn't want to photocopy anything from the book. Um, you can see here this chart in the book of like dry when there isn't any fertile cervical fluid, sticky, which is kind of like the glue sticky type of thing, and it, it has its permutations. 
creamy, which is kind of like the hand lotion-y side. And some women have copious amounts of this and can really see it like, oh, and here in the egg white, which you can see here, um, stretches. Uh, there. Mm, sorry, mirror image here. Great. Okay. Yeah, you can see in that slippery, streaks, and stretchy section. Um, these are other just interesting, cool pictures. This is like fertile cervical fluid literally pouring out of a woman's kind of dilated cervix. Uh, and I'll just show you another picture of this, of the cervix um, at the different phases here. So you can see here beforehand when the cervix, you see in the middle, in the middle picture when the woman is fertile, you see that her cervical position is, you see the cervix is more open than in the other pictures. And you also see, there we go, thank you. Then you also see that the cervical fluid is kind of stretchy. What you see on top is the chart of those people who actually do chart what's going on. So that brings us to the third fertility sign after the woman ovulates. So if we go back to our picture for a second with the hormones and all of that, um, after the woman ovulates, uh, the corpus luteum, which has uh, released the, um, the egg when the luteinizing hormone peaked, um, on the, the page of the hormones. So you see there that what happens to the, to the, um, the follicle, you see at the top row of the ovarian histology, the follicle itself, um, its job is not over. Like its goal in life is to help this egg reach fruition and to become a person, if you know that's what's supposed to be happening that month. Uh, so after it releases the egg, then in addition to the estrogen that the body was producing to, to, to create the uterine lining, the, 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 the follicle collapses it becomes what's called a corpus luteum, which means yellow body in Latin. Um, and that brings us to the second half of the cycle, which is called the luteal phase, which you see it says up there on the chart. Um, and, and at that point, the corpus luteum, it's yellow because it's producing progesterone, which is a yellow hormone. And it produces progesterone from the surface of the ovary, from the follicle. And the progesterone's job is to keep the uterine lining in place. Basically, what it's telling hormonally to the body is like, I just sent my baby off without a cell phone. I don't know if it's gonna land fertilizer your, your uterus or not, but like, do me a favor, leave the beds made for the next two weeks or so. And like, if my baby makes it, tell them to call home from the landline. That calling home from the landline is like, if the egg does get fertilized in those 24 hours that it's alive, it will multiply, divide, multiply, divide, Im implant itself in the uterus, and then produce the hormone HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. That is a hormone that people pick up in pregnancy tests. I mean, that means something has arrived. If there is HCG, so then the corpus luteum will keep making progesterone. At a certain point, um, the placenta will be built and it will take over the progesterone production, but the progesterone will continue being released. However, if the woman doesn't conceive, so this corpus luteum has its own internal clock of like how long it's gonna tick for, uh, that, that, and basically until um, until it's gonna say like, okay, obviously this egg didn't make it, we didn't get the phone call of the HCG. And for each woman, she's gonna have a different number like number of days that that window is gonna be, that a corpus luteum is gonna do its thing. It's generally between, I, I think the range is 10 to 16, I think 12 to 14 is probably like the more typical standard. Um, but that, and that luteal phase, it like, it's happening because of the progesterone that's released from the corpus luteum. And that's kind of like a desert island hormonally and that it doesn't really matter what else is going on in the woman's life. Gen generally, she will always have the same luteal phase. It's not gonna change from month to month. It doesn't matter if things are stressful in her life, like that's gonna be her luteal phase. Um, and when she is in that luteal phase, her body temperature is gonna be a smidgen warmer because her body is trying, like the progesterone kind of does this incubator thing that it keeps things a tad warmer as for the, tad, by tad, I mean like in Fahrenheit, we're talking about like a 0.2 degree difference. So when we talk about temperature and you see it on this chart as well, of body temperature here that's in Celsius between 36 and 37, uh, basal body temperature is what they call like the temperature that women body is at when they wake up in the morning. So this does involve more than just perceiving cervical secretions or feeling for cervical position. It does involve a regular thermometer that people can keep in their beds. Uh, women who are practicing FAM as a method, not just as like some general information, uh, they will take their temperature every morning. It will vacillate as you saw in mean, this picture of this chart, but I'll just put it here for you again, where you see that, you know, the woman's temperature will vacillate in a lower register before she ovulates. And this chart is vacillating from um, 98.6 to 90, oh no, she's actually 97.6. She has a low, low basal body temperatures, but once she ovulates, you see that there's this jump and it's going to vacillate in a higher register. 
Um, and people who do chart, and this book has a chart, and there are charts online, and you know, everyone can do what works for them. But there are people who are like hardcore charters. If anyone's really using the method for contraception, they really do need to chart to be able to count on it. Um, but that's, uh, that is the third sign, which has to do with the woman's temperature. So basically, once a woman has higher than, um, not higher, more than, what, if a woman has 17 high temperatures, that's essentially the same as a pregnancy test because it means that after day 16, her corpus luteum didn't stop making progesterone. It kept making progesterone, which means that even though she didn't see the blue line on the pregnancy stick, her body saw the blue line. It saw the HCG, and that's why it's still making progesterone. Uh, if she's not pregnant, which happens for most cycles in women's lives, uh, so then once there is no HCG around, so then the progesterone is going to drop. And as you see on the hormone chart, the progesterone drops, the estrogen drops, and then the woman is going to get her period. Um, and when that happens, then her body recognizes that the hormones are low, she's not pregnant, and they basically start the cycle all over again. So that's basically the lowdown of like what fertility awareness is really about, um, that information that really is at our fingertips in terms of knowing where we are in our cycles. And I think that many people as they reach puberty are told like, yes, you will have all these different types of secretions and they're all healthy and fine, you know, unless it has an unusual smell and then maybe you have a yeast infection. They are healthy and fine, but they actually are telling us very different things about what's going on. Um, and it's really very affirming, I think, for women to, to be aware of that and, and to know what's going on. Okay, so that was the FAM piece. Now it will continue in the slideshow to how this intersects with halacha and basically what goes on halachically with, with uh, different pieces of it. Okay, so just as a review, here's the cervical fluid, the cervical position, and the basal body temperature is what this is basically about. Okay, so great. So as we continue here, what I was going to do next was to go through the halachic sources um, here in the slideshow to really give people a little bit of a sense of how the halachic system works, not just how our body works. Thank God, one of the amazing things that we have here in this um, conference is there are um, so many different resources. One of them are those 10 talks, or these, these short little talks about different topics. And one of them is about this whole law, uh, the whole, all of the hill hook tummy, like what's up with the whole spotting thing. So I'm not gonna go through all the sources now because I wanna have time for us to implement the, like how these things work out halachically. Um, but I do feel, and like I will just say the following. Um, not all blood is created equal, and not all blood is supposed to make the woman nida. Um, if a woman is experiencing a red uterine flow, she is nida. If it's not red or if it's not uterine, and that can be verified halakhically or medically, she is not going to be nida. However, if it is red and uterine, and this is most of the questions that come up on the hotline, if we are dealing with something that is red, it is uterine, but it's not a flow. So then the question is, well, what's the halakhic deal with that? So the halakha deal with that is that biblically, um, and this is something that you can hear in Stacey Goldman's pen talk, which you can find um, in, in the conference, um, easily accessible. And it's also something that if people want to learn more about, there's a lot of information on Ishmat's website. Um, there's this thing called hargasha. Hargasha means sensation. Uh, the halakhic sources assume, Shmuel in the, in the Talmud, he discusses this. He speaks about a case that if a woman sat on the ground, right? The ground was clean. She sat down. She got up. There was blood on the ground when she got up. So we think, oh, that blood must have come from her. She must be Nida. She also says, no, that woman is not Nida because the Torah tells us, um, uh, we have a sort of beef sara that she has to have, like, see the blood. Um, she has to experience the sensation of blood coming out of her internally. Um, and that's something that they're, I would say, the majority, and I don't know what, uh, what percentage majority is, majority of women today don't have this aha moment of internal sensation of like, oh, blood just went, my, my period just started, meaning blood just went from my uterus into my vaginal canal. There are three different understandings of halacha, of what hargasha is. The most common one, both in halacha and physiologically, is this sense, sense of cervical dilation somewhat, which we know does happen physiologically. People can't necessarily identify, those who do have hargasha, and I've met plenty, uh, they can't necessarily say like, you know, oh, that's the feeling of my cervix dilating, but they know that they feel something inside that like means that their period started. Now, when there is a hargasha like that and a woman sees red uterine blood in any quantity, then yes, indeed, she will be nida, even if it was a small amount. However, if she does not have that hargasha, 
So then, in theory, from a biblical perspective, even if it's, we're, again, we're talking, we're not talking about flows. If there's a flow, good, let's like, you know, as Rufo like says, go with the flow. Uh, if, it, if, if it's not a flow and we're dealing with spotting, so then it really becomes this issue of, um, like, the, the, the question of, well, what do we do with this in halacha? Now, biblically, without hargasha, in theory, the woman shouldn't be nida. However, we all know a pilchot nida is a pretty big deal, uh, and isrkar, it's a pretty big deal. So Chazal, you know, the rabbinic sages back in the times of the Mishnah and the Gemara, they decided that it was critical to codify laws for that type of spotting. Spotting that was not accompanied by a hargasha, which biblically seems like it shouldn't be a big deal. That being said, it's really close to an isrkar hate, so like, let's be careful. So it's very, very clear, and if we advance in the slides a little bit, we can just see one quick story that illustrates basically the rabbinic um, agenda about spotting. As we wait for the for the slides to come up, I'll just start telling over, um, you know, keep, right, okay, so we spoke about this, the color source, et cetera, and this is the Harkasha we spoke about. And if we just go forward to the story with, um, uh, Right, okay, that, 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 here's the translation, here's the Hebrew one about rabbinic attitudes um, regarding spotting. So we see the story in the Gemara, where, which basically really indicates to us that the rabbinic agenda was that women really should not be becoming Misa from their spotting. That's not what the Torah wanted. That being said, there is some spotting and there are scenarios that the woman could end up becoming Misa. But we see the agenda was so like, no, like don't do that. And I think that many women, you know, always feel like if they, you know, if they're avoiding becoming Nida, that they must be cheating the system. But if they're avoiding becoming Nida from spotting, that is the system. It's not cheating the system. That you're, you're supposed to avoid becoming Nida from spotting. And that's what the rabbi's agenda was. And we see this story about, um, you know, I'm going to skip the story because I really want to get to the practical FAM and halacha things. But there is a story in the Mishnah that really shows us and you can access um, later and pause, <laughs> pause on the recording to read it yourself, we really see that the agenda was like, you know, if there's anything else to attribute it to, it's fine, et cetera, et cetera. And if we go to the next slide, uh, you can really just see like in terms of the laws of spotting, the minute we're not dealing with a flow, uh, then as long as, you know, the size is smaller than a grass or it's uncolored or it's on something not in the summa, if you can attribute it to something else or if um, it's in a location that's not really incriminating, um, we can... Uh, then none of those spotting, none of that spotting will be an issue. Now, the area that spotting becomes an issue is what's Safed Kargasha, which is, I think, in two slides from here. Um, those rules we just spoke about. Okay, so Safed Kargasha, and I'm not going to read it inside either. Basically, even though Hargasha is such a clear parameter in terms of determining Nisa status, there are situations in which, um, meaning, I'll say that sentence again. For a woman to rely on all the leniencies of spotting, meaning that if it's uncolored, it's fine. If it's small, it's fine. If it's on dandelion, it's fine. The, the entry ticket to all of those rabbinic rules is the fact that she can say that there was no hargasha. Now, this is a halakhic reality statement. Even, even a woman who never had a hargasha in her life, like she can't rely on the laws of Ketamim if halakhically she can't say that there was no hargasha. There are three scenarios brought down in the Gemara where we assume that the woman can't say with definitively that there was no hargasha because there was something else going on in the area of her pelvic floor that blocked her ability to be able to sense her hargasha. One of those is urination, even though it's a different system, it's the same general geographic area of the body. Um, but if a woman were to see blood while, or, or for Ashkenazim, in Nishmat for uh, in Israel for another 15 seconds after urination, uh, that's something that's considered a hard gusha blocker. Um, inserting anything into the vaginal canal is considered a hard gusha blocker. Um, and finally, uh, intercourse and the 15 seconds after intercourse are also considered a hard gusha blocker. So if a woman was involved in a hard gusha blocking activity, which is basically like blocked her reception to her pelvic floor where she would otherwise feel hard gusha, so then basically she doesn't get that entry ticket of like, oh, there was no hargasha, so I can rely on those leniencies. What she has to do um, in that case is to say like, okay, this has become a suffix hargasha situation. And since we're dealing with a do a biblical law, we say suffix do rights of a meaning any time a woman is inserting something in the vaginal canal, um, which is what comes up with FAM. So then she, if she were to see blood and what she inserted into the vaginal canal, be it a fatigue cloth, a tampon, when it wasn't really her period, her finger, if we're talking about FAM, her diaphragm. Um, if a woman sees blood on something that was in the vaginal canal, it doesn't matter how small it is, that can make her needs up. Now, she doesn't have to look at it. She doesn't have to make herself need to unnecessarily, but it is important that women understand that things they find externally um, on things that are not macabre, tuma, like panty liners or on colored underwear, those things will not make them need to. If they find something on their skin, 
on their flesh and it's larger than a gris, it can make them nida. And if they find something internally in the vaginal canal, it could be the size of a poppy seed or smaller. Um, it will make them nida unless you know they scratch themselves and can verify that the blood was not actually uterine. So that brings us now to the slide of like, okay, how do we put together this halachic information? And this is just a summary chart that people can also revisit at their convenience. I left it in Hebrew. Okay, so here we go. So what I did on this chart is I kind of stuck in there on the line, um, women's cycles along that bottom. I left it in Hebrew. Um, Vesed is menses, which you know. So the follicular phase as the body is ripening the follicle comes out generally in the Shiva Nikim. The woman's mikvah night should be coming out more or less around ovulation. That's where it says tevila. And then after tevila, the luteal phase, when the body's kind of waiting around to see if the woman conceives, should be coming out afterward. Um, okay, so then what does this mean for people practicing FAM? Uh, so on the next slide, basically, let's just go through each part of the cycle and the different halachic issues that may or may not come up. So while the woman is nida, now people who are learning FAM, they're gonna check their, they'll check their secretions every day, they might check their cervical position every day. When a woman is nida, a woman is nida. She can check whatever she wants, it's not gonna make her on nida. She's nida anyway, she can insert her fingers, she can look at her fingers. Now the inserting fingers is something that women might do for one of two reasons. One is to check cervical position, and the other is some women find that they don't have copious amounts of cervical secretions and they can access and assess them accurately much better if they insert two fingers and just kind of milk that secretion from the um, like from the cervix itself. Uh, so one of the questions women asked was about the postpartum um, practicing of FAM, which is something that many people, I mean, I can't say numbers, but that's something a lot of people do choose to do, especially if they're nursing. Um, according to the LAM rules of lactational amenorrhea method, they'll kind of just like monitor their secretions to see when they start becoming fertile. And when they see that they start becoming fertile, then they'll consider if they are not ready to have another child, they'll consider using some form of barrier method, which is what people usually do if they're doing FAM, or they'll decide they want to put an IUD or take hormones or whatever, but they kind of feel like if I'm not ovulating anyway, because I'm nursing uh, so then I don't want to do that so often nursing women have very small amounts of cervical secretions so some such women will often choose to check internally um, so while a woman is neither she could do whatever she wants if we go to the next slide um, uh, the more critical window that we're really uh, uh, that women most want to check their secretions often is as they're approaching mikvah um, during their shivanikian so the um, right okay so the slide after this uh, okay, so a woman may attempt to have sex. So this is just a back point. A woman may accept her, her have tower even if her period is not physiologically completely over. As long as the red flow has stopped, she may clean herself internally and attempt to get an acceptable check for her have sex tara. Um, that's something really important for people trying to conceive. Um, I have encountered many, many women from all walks of religious practice who feel like, oh, I can't be in my shiva nikim because it has to be halakhically clean. Um, like, they, meaning because they have to be physiologically clean. They don't have to be physiologically clean, they have to be halakhically clean. And um, for them to be halakhically clean, that means it can't be a problematic color. It means that a problematic color can't be on a bazika cloth. But if the flow is over, women can certainly attempt to start their process. And if they know that they ovulate kind of early and they're concerned about missing ovulation and they're aware of that because of FAM, they should for sure speak to a halakhic authority or a malava or whatever, somebody to help them figure out how they can get to the mikvah sooner. Um, okay, now on the next slide, we see in terms of being in the Shiva Nikim. Um, and I will also, I brought a bunch of demos and things to show all of you in our last few minutes, which is connected to this. Women who find that their cycles are just dragging out and their flow is really long. Something that many, and I'm not here to advocate for any specific company, product, or anything, and everyone should do their own research um, responsibly. But the menstrual cups is something that women really enjoy on many levels. Uh, I brought one from tons of companies have sent me samples. It was one of my productive procrastinations was reaching out to them. This one, Ruby Cup donates one to some woman in Africa for everyone that somebody buys, or at least they used to. They come in different sizes, but basically women um, insert uh, this menstrual cup instead of a pet or a tampon into their vaginal canal. Um, it kind of just sits in their vaginal canal um, and it. this one actually even tells you how much blood it's collecting. It's pretty cool because you see the clear um, cervical fluid and you see the blood and like some people find that absolutely fascinating uh, and you know I'll just say I mean menstrual blood is menstrual blood it's all a matter of how you're used to seeing it whether it's like 
observed in a tampon or collected in a cup, it's often like a reframing thing. Other people have no interest, but I will say many women find it concentrates the flow of their period into around two or two days. And even if they're still spotting, they can often get an earlier half stick. So I thought that was a product worth showing. And um, so, yeah, if we go back to the slides, so uh, once a woman is in her Shiva Nikiyam, so then she uh, is probably going to want to check her secretions. As we mentioned, if she checks internally, uh, so first of all, she doesn't have to look at her fingers to know what the secretion is like. You, if you touch glue stick and if you touch egg white, you know that they feel different. Uh, they will smell different. The secretions are far more acidic smelling when they're not fertile and far sweeter smelling when, when the woman is fertile. Um, and those types of uh, differences are certainly perceptible and cervical position is also you don't have to look at anything you're just feeling so if a woman is going to check her uh, insert her fingers during her shiv and there are different halakhic opinions about this Rabbi Amin's sock which appears on Ishmat's website is that it is permissible for her to check and to not look at her fingers she obviously has to do whatever bedikot she has to do for her shiv and this doesn't count instead or anything like that um, but she I think most women prefer, even if they know they're not going to be spotting, they often prefer not to look at their fingers um, if they're doing checks during shivinikiyam because they don't want to inadvertently see blood that can make them niza. And that's halakhically acceptable according to the Psaq Anishmat's website where a woman can insert a, a finger, two fingers, whatever it is, feel whatever she wants to feel, wash her hands afterwards without looking and they're, you know, not put herself at risk of becoming niza unnecessarily. Great, so on the next slide, um, once the woman is going to the mikvah, so then it's basically two different um, options. The women interested in contraception deal with different issues with FAM than the women deal who, who, who are trying to conceive. If a woman is trying to avoid pregnancy, so just a few things, you know, women don't have to be sexually active on mikvah night. It's certainly something that we hope healthy couples would want to be sexually active. But if there's some reason and if it's a fertility related reason that the couple really feels like, you know, this is not pop, this is not an option for us. So then that's uh um, as long as it's mutually agreed upon, um, then that is legitimate. That being said, most orthodox people who practice FAM, because so much of the month is off limits anyway, they choose to use reliable barrier methods for when they're going to be sexually active. Um, I, I brought, so diaphragms are, um, you know, condoms are problematic. We don't have time to go through all the halakhic sources here, but diaphragms, according to, um, I think, I mean, it's different orders of priority for different post game, but, but really have become much more halakhically acceptable. Diaphragms are basically something that women insert into the vaginal canalta um, that basically block the cervix. These are two that I got from a health care. None of these things have ever been in anyone's bodies from medical samples. They don't have holes in real life. Women have to get fitted. As you can see, the diameter from the back, it wedges in behind the woman's cervix in the back and in the front by the pubic bone. I'm sorry, I don't have that foam thing that demonstrates that. But it's kind of like different women have different internal diameters and it's really important to get measured because as you can see, diaphragms that are specifically sized come in very different sizes. There is a one size fits all diaphragm called the Kaya diaphragm, uh, which is not a one size fits all, it's a one size fits most. They also say a woman must get fitted, but it might be easier to obtain. Uh, women often use these with spermicide. Though that's really considered diaphragms from what I know to be the most effective barrier method. If women choose to use spermicide alone, um, and hotza'at zara is not considered a halakhic problem. Uh, you know, the concern of hotza'at zara is that there isn't full, it's considered vatala to waste when, when there isn't full genital contact between the man and the woman, and anything that's a chemical barrier or a physical barrier that's high up in the vaginal canal seems to not pose that problem. Vaginal contraceptive film, the VCF is a company that's making all sorts of products. I understand they're coming out with new products. The one that's most available in Israel at this point is this film that has a very high concentration of spermicide that women fold and insert onto their onto the entrance of their cervix where it dissolves and forms a gel. Um, it's a relatively user-friendly um, spermicide, but it's not always necessarily, you know, the, FAM will be as effective as the barrier method that, that a woman chooses to use and whether she's abstaining on her most fertile days or not. So if we go back to the slide to just finish up in terms of those using it for contraception and then we'll quickly speak about conception. Um, so that that's basically what people can do in terms of avoiding pregnancy. Um, on the uh, right, and so, okay now in terms of for those interested in conception with mikvah night, so as I mentioned, if a woman sees that fertile cervical fluid before she makes it to the mikvah, she should for sure speak to somebody. Um, 
It's not, the issue isn't just that she's ovulating before mikvah. It's often that her egg is also not sufficiently ripened in a healthy way. It's usually like a larger picture of hormonal imbalance. There's so many things women can do, um, whether it has to do with acupuncture or there's a lot of different things people can do. Um, and, it, you know, I think that people are encouraged to try to seek hormonal balance and emotional support is also really helpful. Um, on the following slide, we just see in terms of, um, uh after immersion okay so the, the other small uh issues of ono prusha we don't have time to really address right now the other things um we basically spoke about i'm going to keep uh, going to just finish here if anyone needs to leave that's fine uh the um right so in terms of ono prusha that's something that also you can read about in Shmat's website in terms of figuring out dates of abstinence based on what people have been doing FAM for a while and they know they have a consistent luteal phase. If their dates of abstinence of ono prisha fall out when they're for sure in their luteal phase, some rabbinic authorities would say that, you know, they would just go based on their luteal phase, but it would have to be pretty consistent. Uh, but we have information of that on the website. Sorry, that was the last point. If we go back to the top, as I said, if, you know, once people are not Nida, they're welcome to check internally. Looking at fingers is something that could make a woman need to unnecessarily. And I think women are encouraged if they're at all concerned that they will see some type of spotting um, to figure out how to assess those secretions without looking. Um, as we mentioned, anything a woman sees on underwear, on toilet paper, you know, as we always say, wait 15 seconds before wiping if you're Ashkenazi. But if you did that and then you see something on your toilet paper, even if it's blood tinged, it doesn't matter, it's fine. Women can easily assess their secretions that way if they have sufficient quantities. Um, and as if people are using barrier methods like a diaphragm or inserting their fingers to put in something like a spermicide, they should also wash their hands without looking. Um, and let's, I think that, let's see what the next slide. Okay, so uh, I'm happy to take any questions based on anything that I didn't cover that you're interested in hearing. Um, and while you send in your questions, I'll just say that um, my information there, my email and phone number are both there. I'm here in Israel. That's a, a plus 972 number. It is a phone that does not receive texts or WhatsApp, uh, but you are more than welcome to send me an email and you're more than welcome to call. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions um, that anybody has about any of this. Um, and in terms of resources, I think there are a lot of, you know, I think that people need to be careful with uh, different types of um, apps, et cetera, you know, anything that again is just predictive as opposed to observatory, like observational is something that is not going to give people a full picture. Um, in terms of a dark room, dark, you know, if people can't see what's on their fingers, that's fine. Um, some people prefer turning off the bathroom lights because they feel like that just makes it easier. They should wash their hands before they leave the dark room. But yeah. And again, you know, I think that most women don't see random spotting. And many women who practice FAM will look at their fingers very, very calmly. Um, if, you know, and most spotting that women experience often has to do with other contraceptive methods they're using. If they're doing FAM, um, they often don't have spotting and women, many women are fine looking at their fingers, et cetera. Again, during Shivan Akim, it kind of feels riskier for some women, uh, but either way, um, Women may look, they just have to recognize they're taking a risk of becoming Nida unnecessarily if they look at their fingers when they're checked internally. I missed that. Um, okay, so I, I don't I don't want to say that, meaning the, the never look at, you know, the, all these never say never, I think it has a lot to do with what a woman knows about her body. If a woman knows that she's nursing and spotting, so yeah, good idea not to look at her fingers. If a woman never spots a day in her life and she gets her period, then her period is over. So then I don't know that she needs to be so concerned about looking at her fingers. And I will, I, this is an important opportunity to say, FAM as like as general awareness, I think it'd be helpful for anyone who's not on something hormonal to know what's going on. As a method of contraception, it is not right for everyone. You know, because really it's in the woman's hands, which is its strength and also its weakness, the sense of, you know, women only have to be using a barrier method when they're fertile. That's the, the pros, you know, that women choose this because it, it fits with their ideology, with their lifestyle. You know, people who, you know, they realize one day, wait, I don't drink Diet Coke and when I have a headache, I take water instead of Tylenol and I'm popping hormones every day. Like people have this aha moment. Other people like the method because they feel like it's just fat.
fascinating. And why would they, you know, be on something all the time if they can just know when they're fertile? Um, and, and it is really in their hands to choose when they need to use a contraceptive, but you know, a barrier method or not. That is also what makes it not right for some people. People are very anxious. They feel like they can't assess their secretions. They're nervous to be together with their husband because they think they might be really fertile. It affects their spontaneity because they have to put in the barrier method. You know, so for some people at some points in their lives and for some people at all points in their lives, like this is just so not for them. Um, but yeah, so that is something for people to consider that sometimes even if they're very like ideologically connected to it, if they see that it's really impacting their ability to like relax and enjoy being intimate with their husbands, like then it's probably like worth it checking out if there's something else that they can be doing. And I have encountered women who have put in an IUD for a while while they felt, until they felt comfortable because a, a non-hormonal IUD doesn't play with people's hormones. And, and, and then they're able to, to continue learning about their bodies before they, um, before they uh, before they kind of rely on just their using of a barrier method. Um, the question of, you know, halakhic approach to contraception, I think is far beyond the scope of what we're doing here. I think it's clear that everything is in Hashem's hands ultimately, um, and, that, and that we also have to put in our due diligence to make sure that we're able to bring children into the world in a way that we can care for them wholesomely. Um, and every post safe from every community has their list of reasons women should be using contraception, and that list is going to be different for different communities. Um, whether people think it's a halakhic question or not, I think it's valuable for people to have mentors so they can consult with to figure out like is this the right time for us to be trying to bring another neshama into the world um i missed that other question there um okay so in terms of the postpartum period as i mentioned women often especially if they're nursing uh feel like they don't want to have to go on something else especially as something else that causes spotting um many women end up at fam because they've had so many spotting issues on other things or because they have other health issues that they can't use hormones and um, uh, checking the secretions internally i think is helpful for a lot of women when they're practicing postpartum and i would say they're more than otherwise having a fertility awareness educator is something that's extraordinarily helpful in terms of building women's confidence um within this in this book by Tony Wexler, she has like a very, very short addendum about um, the postpartum FAM. And here in Israel, where so many women uh, are coming specifically at that window in life, it's like a more developed field. I know Michal Schoenbrunn, who you can check out her website, it's it's also in English, poryutv.com. Uh, so she, her, her name and is cited there and website on one of the earlier slides, so you can reference it back. Uh, she has like all of these charts, like she really has very much developed the question of like the postpartum uh, use of FAM for accurately assessing when fertility does return. Um, any other questions before we sign off for tonight? Um, okay, so again, the checking for cervical position with concern for the needs of tummy issues, it's exactly what we've been speaking about here. Um, that as long as a woman is F looking at those things on something external, which is not the cobble tuma, like her colored underwear, uh, or her toilet paper, not close to urination, uh, you know, whatever's on it didn't get there during your, or right after urination. Uh, so then any assessing that is fine. If a woman were to put something with blood on it in larger than the size of, uh, a, something with a surface ever, area of 19 millimeters and it had blood on it that could make her nida. If she's checking internally, the smallest drop of red could make her nida. Um, and then therefore it would be a, a valuable to choose to figure out how to assess the secretions without looking at them. Great. So again, my contact information, that that one I think we okay. answered in that group. Uh, we feel free to be in touch anytime. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Um, and may God really bless us all with the ability to uh, feel a sense of wholeness and connection to ourselves, our bodies, and halacha, and to be able to live that harmoniously. Um, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. And may we all be blessed with, with good health and um uh yeah with with for, with uh with blessings connected to fertility whether that's connected to having having children or not having children in a way that we can optimally raise the next generation to be um agents and serve Hashem in this world thank you for your time and your attention have a good evening or day i was told to go over if that's okay <laughs> okay <laughs>